Great. Thanks for joining us again tonight on this webinar, Introduction to Blue Water Spearfishing with Neil Dorian. Um, we're going to get straight into it tonight. So welcome back to Neil, who is the brand manager for um, Australian Underwater Products, which covers Rob Allen, Ocean Hunter, Salvamar, and many other brands. Neil, thank you so much for coming along today. And I'm going to pass it over to you. Thanks very much, Carmen. Um, and um, yeah, thanks for giving me the time to talk about one of my favourite little topics, which is blue water spearfishing. So uh, I've been spearfishing now for the last 30 odd years and um, probably for the last 20 or so been very keen um, from a blue water uh, spearfishing perspective. So just going to talk to you tonight about a little bit about um, uh, blue water spearfishing as a whole, about uh, bluefin tuna in particular. Uh, we'll talk about what equipment is used and, and what differs from the normal equipment that we uh, use for spearfishing. We'll talk about um, the teamwork uh, because with blue water spearfishing, working as a team is, is particularly important and, and really does make a difference with results. Uh, we'll talk about some of the different techniques uh, that you would use for different species. So I'll talk about both temperate and tropical blue water species, uh, just to give you a little bit of an idea about that. Um, talk about some of the species that we can target off the coast here in New South Wales and then just cover any questions as, as they, they may come up. But I guess first of all the question is really what is blue water spearfishing and blue water spearfishing is really the targeting of offshore species uh, of pelagic fish. Uh, typically that could be of offshore seamounts off the continental shelf. It can also be um, some more inshore pelagic species like your kingfish um, and Spanish mackerel up in the, um, up in the more tropical um, climes where it's not necessarily blue water when you're targeting those species, but they are still considered uh, pelagic species. Um, so look, let's have a look at the equipment to start with, uh, just to give you an idea of some of the, um, the differences out there compared to your traditional um, setup. And one of the, the major differences is in the um, spear guns, um, typically in the size and, and, and the style of the spear gun um, we use. Um, so the first gun I'm gonna show you is actually a gun that I won in a um, spearfishing competition. Not that I've speared in many of those, but about 20 odd years ago, and I was lucky enough to win a gun that was custom made by a guy in Sydney by the name of Matt Alexander. And this is it here. So, you can all see that. It's a big cannon of a uh, spear gun. Um, so it has five bands, it has a 10 mil shaft, and it has an absolute heap of mass. This thing weighs an absolute ton. So it's, it's kind of hard to dive with when you're diving deep because you've got to carry the thing up and down, but it really does pack a, a punch, so it's, it's fantastic for those longer shots and, and targeting those bigger species like your dog tooth tuna, uh, marlin and uh, um, bluefin tuna. Now, one of the things what we will be talking about tonight, and I've got it on this gun, is a slip tip. Um, can we all see that clearly, Carmen? Can you see the, the, yeah, yeah, good. So this is the slip tip here. And the idea of a slip tip um, and why they work very well with uh, pelagic um, species is the tip is designed to go completely through the fish and deploy out the other side of the fish. So if you look at this, the, this would be sitting out on the other side of the fish and the fish's body would be between the, the cable there. Um, so it's a much stronger holding um, um, type of scenario than a normal straight shaft and that's why a lot of people prefer it on, on particularly some of the, you know, the, the faster fish out there like Wahoo. This gun has a 10mm shaft um, so it packs a, a, a big hitting um, power and penetrates through fish really really well. Now I'll show you a couple of others. We've got, this is a much more familiar spear gun to a lot of you. Um, so and I would say if you wanted to use your standard setup of spear gun as a European style gun like this Rob Allen, um, I would say you probably need a 1.3 or a 1.4 um, spear gun. 
The good thing about this type of gun is it's one that you are totally familiar with if you use this type of gun for your normal spearfishing. So you're transitioning to a gun that fires um, much the same way, uh, may have a little bit more recoil than the gun you're used to, but it works exactly the same way. You aim the same way, the trigger pull is the same. So I do recommend for a lot of people, if you're starting with blue water spearfishing, that you do try and stick to the same gun. If you've got something like a one meter or 1.1 uh, Rob Allen, then to transition to a 1.3 or a 1.4 Rob Allen is a great way to go, particularly for some of your local species like your Mahi Mahi offshore, um, your Wahoo, your Spanish mackerel, that type of fish. So this is a 1.3 powered by twin 16 mil rubbers. It's got an open muzzle, which I find on the longer guns makes it a little bit easier to aim. And you'll notice that this one has got a double flopper or double barb scenario. And this is a new shaft option that uh, Rob Allen brought out a couple of years ago. And it just gives better holding power than a standard single barb. So if you're wanting to you know, target kingfish and some of those bigger fish locally, and you want a, a more secure um, type um, shaft, this is a great way to go. It does have the advantage of being a straight shaft over the, over the, um, the slip tip that I was just showing you um, in that they tend to be a little bit more accurate generally. Um, but on those softer, real fast fish like Wahoo probably don't have the, the holding power. But that's a, a pretty simple setup and that's still certainly powerful enough to handle a bluefin tuna, you know, a marlin if you got close enough and you push the shaft right through the other side. We we'll then look at one of the newer styles of spear guns. And this one is a roller gun, and I set this one up for the last trip that we did down the coast for tuna. Didn't get to fire it, but this is a 1.2 roller gun, so it's going to give about the same power as a 1.6 in a, in a standard European type um, gun with a single rubber. So very powerful, um, but very manoeuvrable. So if you're targeting fish like your, your tuna, which um, tend to you know, be, I guess, incredibly fast and do require you to move the gun around quite quickly to track the fish. These are a good option. Now I've got this one set up with the new Rob Allen drop barb um, type scenario. This works very similarly to the slip tip. Let's just pull this off here. So the advantage of it over the slip tip is that it is still a straight shaft, so you don't lose the accuracy with the rob uh, the the, the wobble of the of the um, of the slip tip and the drop barb just simply releases like so and then your barb sits out of this side of the shaft so this is relatively new from my balance i'm yet to try it on a really big fish i'm quite keen to, to get out there and do that but certainly rob has reported really good success with the drop barb um, over in south africa um, already um, we've got them available in seven and a half and eight um, mil shafts as well. Now this one I've also set up as a breakaway, which is what I recommend that you do when you're going after blue water species. So I've just simply connected the breakaway here to the line release, so I'll just pull the trigger. The safety was off. There we go. You'll see that your um, shock cord is released from your line release. And then your trailing piece of mono connects to your sharp tip of your float. So you're basically left with your spear gun and your float system is separate from that. And this is a reinforced loop that you put over your mono and your sharp clip simply holds onto that. So that's called the breakaway setup. There's a couple of different ways you can do that. You can use the existing um, shock cord from your spear gun for that lower section, that's what a lot of people do if they're transitioning from a traditional setup to a breakaway. The other gun that people are starting to consider is this type of roller, which is a little bit more of a hybrid type roller, um, similar uh, to the multipliers, but it doesn't have your, your roller system here. Some people call them inverted rollers, but this one's a bit more of a, of a hybrid. So your rubber sitting underneath with some extra stringers here. Super powerful gun. I've only tested this a couple of times, but certainly gives really good power. 
I would say for this to be perfect for uh, your pelagic blue water spearfishing though, you would do away with the straight shaft and you would either run a, a slip tip or a drop bar shaft for it to be, um, I guess, the best in performance. So there's a couple of, of different spear gun options and, it, and um, it really sort of depends on um, you know, the, the, the type of, of, of spearfishing that you're already doing um, to, I guess, decide on the, on the um, spear gun that's going to best suit your needs. I think there's a bit of a shift away from the big five rubber cannons. They just are too hard to manoeuvre. A lot of people do use the three rubber with an eight mil shaft and the roller guns are becoming super popular, but there's a lot of different options out there. Certainly a lot more than there, there was when I sort of started 20 years ago, where we're all just using either a, a, a twin band gun or a, or a multi band gun. Um, the other thing that we, we use, which is a little bit different um, compared to your normal spearfishing scenario is the float system. So, I'll show you one of the points that I would recommend. Now, because these fish fight incredibly hard, um, we recommend a much more buoyant float system like this one here. This is a three atmosphere float. And what that means is that um, a standard float, when you blow it up, wouldn't even give one atmosphere of pressure. This one gives three atmospheres, so it's 45 PSI of pressure that goes into this float. So it's not quite filled up to that at the moment, but it is absolutely rock hard. So if you think about the, the pressure volume density relationship of um, floats in the water, if it's filled with air and it gets pulled under, then a normal float at 10 meters is gonna be half its size. So if it's filled up with three atmospheres of pressure, it means that at 30 meters, it's still gonna maintain the same buoyancy as it does at the surface. And with a big fish, there's no problem with them pulling a single float down. So a lot of people use two floats connected to each other. Now with these floats, I'll just show a little bit of construction with them. So internally, they've got a separate bladder and that is hooped with this reinforced webbing to give the, uh, to give the float a lot more strength. The outer um, cover, is really just that. It's a thousand denier called Dura cover in a high visibility color, so it's nice and easy to see. And you'll notice that we use quite heavy duty shark clips which connect to your float rope. And there's a couple of different ways you can do that, but um, generally I just have one of those loose and I pull the fish up with the float rope and then tie it off with the other remaining clips. So as you're pulling the, the fish up, you can use um, this is a sort of clutch system to, to um, keep the fish closer to the surface as you're fighting it. So there's a lot of other different float options out there. Um, some people use solid foam floats as well. I just find the three atmosphere floats are great from a travel perspective. So a, a really good option for that. Um, trying to get some notes. Neil. Those free atmosphere floats, mm -hmm. can you pump them up with the bike pump? How, how do you... Uh... Oh, yeah, good question. I, they, they come with a, um, with a kit. I've got one here. Oh, yeah, here we go. Yeah. So it comes with this kit here. Um, and you can use a bike pump, although there is a little bit of mucking around. This is the standard device that comes with. So this just connects to the bike pump and this section here just pushes into the float and you just push it in um, for it to- Sorry, can you just hold that up higher? I, I, I'm yeah, sorry, can you see that? Yeah, okay. Um, so that's the adapter. What I use is um, typically where I go, um, you know, there's a service station and I just um, use it from a flat tire pressure and pump it up from there. You can pump it all the way up to the 45 PSI. To be honest, I start to get very nervous when it gets up to 35 PSI because they feel absolutely rock hard. But they do um, pump all the way up to the full 45 um, PSI. 
And with the float comes your little measuring um, device as well. And it's quite surprising. They feel rock hard at about 20 PSI. And they just sort of tend to get larger in, in, in sort of um, diameter after that. Um, but you can use a bike pump tonight to, to inflate it. I just put it up against a scuba cylinder and turned the valve on and it pumped it up in no time. So if you've got access to a scuba cylinder, that's a really good option as well. Okay, thanks. Um, so with the float, you, can everybody hear me? Yep. I've lost the screen, that's all. Let me just see if I can. No, you're good. We can all hear you. Okay, great. Thank you. Um, with the float, you also um, need a heavy duty float line. So there's a couple of different options with that. Um, so this is one that is yet to come to market. It's one I've been testing um, that Rob Allen is designing for us. And it's got uh, about a, 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 I think it's 700 kilo braking strain of Dyneema inside it. So that's a very buoyant float rope. Typically we use it about 30 meters. And if we, where is the other loop end? Oh, this is the loop end here. So this would typically connect onto your float system like so. onto here, and as you're fighting the fish, you then can shorten the float right like so, to stop it pulling through um, as it gets close to the surface. There is also an alternative, which um, I got from a brand called Nectonics. So this is a Nectonics float rope, and this is a clutch system that they use. So these both connect to the float, and this clutch actually stops the, the, the float rope from pulling through as you're fighting the fish. You basically pull it down like so, and the clutch stops it, the, the rope from sliding back through again. So that works really well on big fish as well. The other option that you have, and this depends on the type of um, fish that you're targeting, um, and I'll talk about that a little bit later on, is your bungee. So this is a typical Rob Allen bungee, which you put up against your float. Some people connect them to the gun as well. And that just stretches and tires the fish out and takes some of the fight out of the fish. And also takes some of the pressure out of your terminal equipment. So it's a, a good option for some species, but not so great for others. And I'll detail which fish they're better for a little bit later on. There's a heavier duty version of that. That is a cord with heavy duty Dyneema. And then Rife also do a, a bungee. This is their bungee, which doesn't stretch quite as much. Um, so it's good for fish that you really don't want to get close to the reef. Um, personally, on, on fish like dog tooth, I don't bother using a bungee at all anymore. But I will sort of detail that a little bit later on when we go through the various species. Um, the other piece of equipment that I, I find is vital for, for up in the tropics is a teaser setup. And this is what I tend to use uh, as a, a teaser when I'm in the tropics for dog tooth and for wahoo. So it's just a Rob Allen teaser. Not with this connected to the bottom of it. So that's the teaser there. You just deploy that down to, to um, whatever depth that you want to sort of work in. If you're getting fish up to 10 meters, I deploy that in about 10 meters. And connected to that, I also have a fish toggle. So for burley, I tend to leave the burley on the float as well. And then I have a knife, which I use to cut that burley up. So typically I sort of cut the fish up into a mango sort of shape to start with on the boat. And then I just run this knife up against the skeleton of the fish and take off small bits of burley at a time. You don't want a burley too large a chance because it tends to attract sharks. So just small sort of a um, um, couple of centimetre chunks at a time of, of burley down in the water column for, for fish like dog tooth and even wahoo come up on burley quite well. I tend to use that more in a tropical scenario. Um, rather than in, in the temperate water for bluefin and stuff where uh, we tend to be cubing. 
Um, I'm just making sure I've covered all of the equipment side of things. Yeah. Um, so the other thing I mentioned before was teamwork. I find that in the tropics in particular, um, teamwork makes a huge difference to results with, um, with pelagic type spearfishing. So um, if you uh, are talking fish like dog tooth and, um, and wahoo, typically we'll have one person in the dory and three people in the water working as a team. And what I like to, to have as a team is one person working the teaser. So one person working this up and down through the water. Uh, one person under, uh, so one person on the dive and one person breathing up on the surface. And that way you're just about guaranteed to have somebody pretty close to where the teaser is working at all times and in a perfect position to take a shot. And you really need to be diligent as working with a team. I've been on, on trips where we've had um, you know, fish like Wahoo come in and we've had divers straight away um, you know, st uh, start their dive on the fish and there's three divers all approaching this Wahoo from different directions and the fish just takes off straight away. So you just need to take your turn, um, one person on the fish at a time and have a rule in place where nobody else can dive until that person comes back up. And you'll find if you do that, you might not be the best divers, but if you work together as the best team, you tend to get the best results. And I've seen that time and time again on Coral Sea trips where you'll have a couple of really good divers, but not working as a team and not getting the results versus um, you know, a team of, of three, sometimes just average divers. But you know, having a good time, sharing the experience, and, and and not diving on each other's fish. Uh, I went on a trip years ago where we all started diving on each other's fish. There's a lot of wahoo around, um, and you know, by the, you know, none of us landed fish because we were we were just diving on the fish too hard, too worried about the next person um, spearing the fish, and and um, and, and as a result, um, you know, had a poor trip. So it's all about teamwork, particularly, I think, in that tropical scenario. Um, I often find even with sharks, where we're getting more and more shark issues um, to um, you know, protect the fish as it come into the surface, as long as they, they, they aren't overly aggressive sharks, um, you gotta land more fish working as a team rather than individuals. Um, as far as, as species um, to target here in Australia, uh, sorry, in, in New South Wales, um, so we've got the, the marlin, um, both the black and striped marlin. I, uh, you know, haven't had, I haven't speared a marlin. Um, I know, haven't really, I've been out a couple of times, um, been out to the banks and seen one out there and been out on a boat where we were trolling and teased one up and we, we speared one, we were taking turns. But um, to be honest, I found it wasn't really my cup of tea, that form of, of, um, of spearfishing. If I was going to get a marlin, I'd want to be in the water and for the marlin to, I guess, come up to me on its own accord, whether it's come up to, to a teaser, but not actually on a boat trolling and, and teased up to the surface that way. Um, in saying that, if, if you want to target marlin um, during the summer is the best time. Um, and you know, we've got good marlin stocks up and down the coast. So if you wanted to spend the time after them, um, you will certainly get results. You know, blacks do head fairly close to inshore as well. So at certain times of the year when the water temperature is right, it's a matter of just putting the hours in and being in the right place at the right time. Um, but um, typically places like the Banks, which is down off um, the JB coast, um, Devis Bay coast is, is very good. Um, dolphin fish is a pelagic species that we tend to target off Sydney around December. So I typically start looking for them when the water temperature gets up to about 22 degrees. And we target those typically off FADS, fish aggregation devices. And uh, New South Wales Fishery puts them out. Um, they've got um, about three or four off Sydney at the moment. There's also the Wave Rider Boy off Sydney. There's a series of fads up and down the coast. And also people put out their own fads. So I often um, spend a day sort of heading out wide looking for fads that other people have put out. Um, and you tend to get really good results if you can find a, a fad um, that not many people are diving on. 
Um, typically, I'll find the beginning of the season around December is when you get some really big fish coming through. So if you can be out in that early time of the year, um, you tend to get some, some really good results. One of the, the fish that I really love targeting is at this time of the year, uh, which is the southern bluefin tuna. And um, typically, they come through New South Wales in the end of June. You can just about guarantee the end of June, um, we will we will get a run of, of bluefin tuna. And we are talking earlier about, I think the fishery, if anything, um, is improving. Um, you know, this last weekend, I've been up the coast, but they got fantastic results off, off Jervis Bay, both um, spearfishing and fishing. Um, but I typically go down to Naruma. It's one of the first places on the coast that tend to get results. And I go out on a charter boat there, um, which is run by a guy by the name of Ben Bolton. Um, the, the business is called Charter Fish Naruma. It's no relative of mine, but um, he um, does a fantastic job. So we've been down with him for the last four or five years. Um, so the last three years, three years ago, we, we got um, a couple of 70 kilo bluefin tuna. Um, Last year we got a uh, 50 kilo, a um, uh, couple of 50 kilo bluefin tuna. And just the other week I went out with him and um, we sort of went out to the, the same areas as we did the, the year before, which is about 70 k's offshore. There's a seamount out, out past the continental shelf. And it's kind of, it, it can be a little bit boring passing the time. So what we did, we got a, a group of mates, there were six of us, um, three Spiros and three fishermen, which sort of helps cover the cost of the, the, the trip. And what we do is we troll um, until we, we get a hookup. So in that case, we sort of left at six in the morning. We trolled all day until three o'clock in the afternoon. Um, we got a strike at three o'clock. Um, three rods went off um, with, so three fishermen had one each, but one snapped off straight away. Um, one fish took four hours to land, and that was 148 kilos, so pretty close to a record fish. Uh, the other fish fought for five hours and then got eaten by a shark. Now, during that time, the idea is that the minute that you get a strike, you start um, throwing cubes of pilchards over. Um, that's typically how we go after bluefin, because it's a little bit like looking for a needle on a haystack. There's a lot of ocean and, and the fish can often be very deep. So you're looking for the fish to come up to the surface, take the lure, and then you try to bring the rest of the school up with that by chucking cubes down and then the tuna come up the cube trail. And that's worked very well for us over the last couple of years, but it didn't work well for us the other day where it was a, a school of just a few fish. They were enormous fish, but um, yeah, none of, the, none, none of them stayed around to come up the cube trail. So the only fish we saw in the water were the ones that were um, were the ones that were caught. Interesting enough, that fish actually had a tag in it, and it was tagged in 1994 as a 97 centimetre fish. It was caught by a mate of ours by the name of Jason Garling. It was his first fish he ever caught on, on a boat. So he's, he wasn't much of a fish eh? but he's he's certainly got a great story to tell now. Um, when you you spear the bluefin, um, they uh, I used to say they're not a very hard fighting fish, but um, having speared a 70 kilo one now and the 50 kilo last year, I'd say that they, they can be quite hard fighting. And certainly my mates that spent four hours trying to bring in the one the other day, um, you know, it was a, it was a serious fight. Um, typically what you want to do is land a shot, you know, that, that goes right through the fish. So you need the fish to be close enough. They are, they look like they're not moving through the water that quickly, but, um, Remember the first fish I ever speared there, I was aiming just in front of his head and I shot it right at the end of the tail. So they are moving a lot quicker than, than what they look through the water. Um, but it's quite an amazing experience. Um, we, um, the first year I ever got them, we had um, a big blue shark come along and swim with us as I was dragging my one to the surface. And um, it, um, it just stayed with us for about three or four hours during the day, but um, was not aggressive at all. Just amazing um, shark to be hanging around us. But um, they are definitely a fish that if you want to get into um, blue water spearfishing, um, it's a great one to target at this time of the year. 
As I was just mentioning before to a gentleman um, earlier on, the yellowfin tuna have been very, very strong this year as well. Now, I'm yet to spear a yellowfin, so I'm mad keen to get out there. I, I did go down to Narooma a few weeks ago to try to get one, but we, we never got on to any. It can be very hit and miss. Um, years ago, I went out with um, um, Ant um, um, Judge um, offshore and, and his father, Wayne, and um, we had quite a few yellowfin tuna around, but there was lots of mako sharks at the time as well, and we ended up chickening out. We only caught them on rod, but they are amazing fish, um, particularly the larger ones with really big sickles, and, and that's what I'm keen to get. Um, and I think that the fishery, for whatever reason, seems to be improving. Um, so I think there is opportunity for yellowfin tuna. This year, they've seemed to have, have, have been capturing them online um, when they're coming up and, and, and chasing the, um, the, the, the schooling fish on the surface. So it's been real hit and miss, and they haven't been really um, coming into the cube trough. Um, but it's a work in progress. Generally with yellowfin tuna, if you're trying to queue for them, um, also you get albacore tuna, and they're pretty cool fish to, to spear, great eating, um, and um, you know, quite hard to, to, they come through so quick, they're quite hard to, um, um, to um, hit. Uh, the first time I ever went out spearing albacore, I probably missed my first 10 shots before I hit one, they're so quick through the water. Um, so that's, I, I guess, most of your temperate water species. Um, I just wanted to touch on a, the, the on a couple of fin and the blue fin. Do they travel together or, or not? The blue fin, do they travel together, did you say? The yellow fin and the blue fin. The, the yellow fin. Yeah, yeah, look, the coast, they they don't typically the... travel together, but they have been in the same water this year. So we were talking about it when we went down to the room the other day, and certainly there have been people chasing bluefin that have been catching yellowfin and people chasing yellowfin that have been catching bluefin. So they're they have been mixing up in the water a little bit, so there'd be no reason why you wouldn't be out there, say, cubing for one species and have the other species come up the cube trough. It certainly often happens with um, with albacore, and I've, I've had albacore and bluefin together, and I've had yellowfin and, and albacore together. Um, the albacore I got a number of years ago, there was yellowfin everywhere. Um, and I managed to spear, I think, the only two albacore tuna in the yellowfin school, um, which I was a little bit disappointed about. But um, anyway, that's another story. But um, yeah, they, they, they can travel together, but they typically aren't in the same schools per se. What's, what's cubing? What's that all about? So cubing is when, sorry, I should have detailed that a little bit more uh, before. So cubing is when you get something like a pilchard is typically what they use. And they'll cut that into a, into smaller sections, about yay big, and they chuck those cubes over the side. So you would every uh, five, ten seconds or so, you chuck a cube over the side, or maybe two or three pieces of of of, of, of cube, and those sink down um, through the through the the, the the ocean. And the idea is for it to intersect a school of tuna. And for them to work back up the, the cube trail to the surface. So the idea is it brings the fish to the surface. Um, we generally only start cubing for bluefin after we've had a strike though, because it's, it's, it's just too large a scope of water to get out there and sort of hope that the fish will rock up to the cube trail. So we, we tend to get a strike, so we know the tuna are obviously there, and then we start cubing after that. So it's basically burling, but you do it from the boat. So each pilchard would be cut into about three pieces, about that sort of size. Yeah, three or four pieces. To be honest, I'm generally on a on a charter boat, so I'm not doing much of the cutting up. <laughs> I'm in the water screaming at them to chuck more burly in, but, um, but uh, yeah, I have done cubing before, and typically you cut into three or four pieces, and, and I, I normally just get carried away and chuck plenty under. I figure the more, the better. Um, but the idea is just to sort of drip feed and to get that, that trail going. What we often do with the bluefin, when um, they come up to the surface, if they're not quite playing the game, and last season, as, a, as an example, we were finding that they were staying quite deep. They were staying about 20 metres down or so. 
Um, um, and the only time we got them to the surface was when we let a couple of live baits go. And the difference between the tuna um, when it had live bait versus the, the cubes was quite incredible. They came ripping to the surface and the live bait were trying to hide in, in the, you know, underneath the, the hull of the boat, which was like a catamaran, but um, they still got much. So um, yeah, it does, it does make a difference as well. Speaking of the pilchards, are you, when you're in the water with your gun, have you got a handful of pilchards with you as well, trying to? Uh, look, some people do. I tend not to worry about it too much. Typically what I do is breathe up and then um, um, try and relax as much as you can, which is easier said than done when you are, um, when there's, there's dirty rattling fish screaming around everywhere. Um, and then I tend to descend down and, and really targeting one piece of, of pilchard, so one cube. And I'll try to um, keep um, that, uh, that cube in range, but not go too close to it so that it's enticing for the, the tuna to come to. Um, and then it's a matter of timing your shot. So when the tuna's charging towards it, you're trying to sort of uh, pull the trigger at the exact time that it hits the, the cube. Um, when they're traveling incredibly quick, you can, often, you can often miss. I mean, in the albacore, as an example, I've sort of shot at a, a cube and the fish has changed direction and I've missed it by three or four meters, you know, they, they uh, um, but I tend to find with bluefin, they tend to, um, you know, once they're heading towards that, that, that bit of burley, you can just about guarantee that they're going to take it. So it's a matter of just pulling the trigger at the right time and then holding on. Hey, Neil, mm -hmm. I have a question from Glenn Sands. Um, He's basically said his mic's broken, so um, I'll just quickly read this to you. He said, hey, Neil, I'm currently living in Townsville for uni. I've been hitting the coral sea a lot with a couple of visits home to Sydney for eastern slipper lobsters. Mm -hmm. Having no trouble with the reef fish up there, but I found the Spanish mackerel that I've seen have been particularly flighty when they get to a decent size. And even with flushes, they haven't been holding in range. Uh, there are so many sharks up here, burly doesn't seem worth it. But my main question is how to figure out which reefs hold bigger fish, like wahoo and doggies, and also how to find the fish on the better reefs. I've been told the leading edge of the reef is the place to be, but I haven't been super successful. You know yeah, I haven't spent a lot of time spearing off the Townsville area, but typically when I go up that way, I am off the, um, the, the reefs further out. So um, the isolated reefs of, um, of Cato um, and, and Ken and Frederick, et cetera. Um, so they're about three or 400 kilometers offshore. Uh, but typically I do find that um, to get the best results, you tend to look for current running onto the reef. Um, so to the, to the leading into the reef. Um, I tend to find with dogtooth tuna, um, the moon phase does play a part as it does in blue Fin and most tuna species. So a new moon is a much better uh, moon to have for, for those type of, of fish. They do uh, feed nocturnally. So when um, it's a full moon, they tend to, um, I guess they, they tend to eat more comfortably during the night and then they just stay deep during the day. So new moon phase, um, um, current with dog tooth makes a big difference. Um, current running onto the, the front of a reef, I tend to find makes a particularly uh, big difference as well. Um, and time of day, just early morning and late evening, I've found to be the best um, for, for dog tooth. In saying that, you know, I'm yet to spear a dog tooth over, over 50 kilos. So I've speared a lot of doggies, but I wouldn't say I'm an expert at spearing big doggies. Um, I'm yet to sort of get a really good quality one, but uh, they're, you know, they're a cool, cool fish to spear. Um, as far as the Spanish mackerel goes, um, one thing I've found with Spanish mackerel, um, which works really well, is that um, it's one of the only fish that you can dive on it quite hard from behind. So if you see a, a Spanish mackerel swim underneath you, if you, if you swim down quickly, get directly behind it, and then swim um, you know, behind it, you can cover the distance and it starts to sort of zigzag like so. Um, and then it will ultimately start to turn sideways once it sees you. 
and it will normally give you a, uh, a reasonable shot. And the typical shot, particularly with a straight shaft on a, on a Spanish mackerel, is in that second dorsal anal fin. So the back half of the fish is a, is a great holding shot for a Spanish mackerel. They're a little bit like wahoo, they've got quite a big gut cavity, so a lot of people lose mackerel if they, they shoot them in that sort of front section because they, they tear out with a straight shaft in particular with acceleration. Um, do you want me to cover a little bit of the tropical species now? Um, any other questions at the moment, Carmen? Or? Uh, just Blake has just uh, basically commented on the reefs of Townville, Townsville, floods from the north, ebbs from the south, the current Arab reef, urchin shoal and needle shoal. Um, I don't think there's any other questions. If anybody has a question, do you want to just um, pop a, either unmute yourself and ask now or pop a question in the chat box? All right, well, I'll, I'll just talk about Wahoo for a second anyway, um, mm -hmm. Carvin. So, um, Wahoo is probably you know, one of the, my favourite um, species to target up north, and uh, I've had reasonable success with Wahoo when I've worked as a, as a team. So, a guy, a uh, mate of mine who passed away quite a few years ago now, James Tate, and myself had great success just working as a, as a pair. And, and with Wahoo, just using a teaser um, and letting the fish come right in. So I found if you, if you dive too early on a Wahoo, because you're generally in quite clear water, that the fish won't come in and you can try to sort of, I guess, dive alongside it and cover the, and cover the ground. But I found if you just were patient and just kept working the teaser, that often the Wahoo would just come straight up to the teaser. You'd then be able to make your dive directly pretty much on top of it. And you know, there's a couple of, of, of shots. If you're using a straight shaft on a wahoo, then really the only shot I'd recommend is that classic anal um, and, and, and second dorsal um, shot. So that sort of back section of, the, of where, where the fins are. The reason being that it's where the majority of the bone is in the fish. So it's a good holding shot. In saying that, it's probably, a, a, well, it's one of the main fish I'd recommend that use a slip tip or a drop barb on. They've got such amazing acceleration that they just tend to rip um, a straight shaft out the side of them relatively easy. Um, but they're a really cool um, uh, fish to target. Um, with that amazing acceleration, I do recommend with Wahoo that you use a, uh, use a bungee. And a nice stretchy bungee works really, really well. And what I typically do with Wahoo is I don't hold on to the float. So I just let it run, um, and it will typically do one big run to start with, and I just swim after the float and grab it and then start pulling it up. I tend to find if you try to put too much weight on the wahoo that they, they, they do rip out. And I've, the biggest wahoo I ever put a spear into ripped out that way, and I shot it through the gill plate pretty much, and it still managed to get off in the end. So, um, so yeah, it's just one of those fish, the, the cool looking fish in the water. Um, and they're great to target. They uh, will come up to you if you're patient. Um, I tend to find with Wahoo what typically happens if you've got an inexperienced team is people dive on them too soon. And then before you, you know it, you're all diving on the fish far too early and the fish never, never come in close enough. Um, with Dogtooth, which is the other species that I tend to target when I'm doing pelagic spearfishing up north, Unfortunately, the gear set up for a dog tooth is pretty much the opposite of what you use for Wahoo. So I'm often finding that I'm getting Wahoo with a dog tooth set up because you definitely want it, don't want to target dog tooth with a, with a bungee um, because they are a really incredibly hard fighting fish. Even, you know, like I said, I haven't speared one over 50 kilos yet, but a, a 40 kilo dog tooth. You know, it feels like a, a like a more than a than the, than the 70 kilo bluefin I caught. They just fight incredibly hard. So typically, the shot that I look for for a dog tooth is one that's going to put a lot of a lot of hurt into it. So typically through the through the the pec fins and out through the gill plate um, and trying to sort of get through some vital um, organs. They tend to um, sort of stop when you spear them, do a bit of a shake of their, their, their fins and then they just take off. And they just take off down to the nearest bit of reef um, and try to uh, drag all your gear through the reef and snap off. Um, 
The other issue with dog tooth tutor is they tend to swim around a fair bit with um, sharks. And um, as the guy was alluding to from up in um, Townsville, um, you know, one of our fortunate things, um, or fortunate depending on, um, on, on if you wanted to look at sharks or if you're spearfishing, is that the shark numbers are really on the increase um, on those offshore reefs. And the last time I did a, a trip out to the Coral Sea north of Cairns, we hardly landed a dog tooth. Um, just by the number of sharks. They weren't big, but they were just there in, in numbers every time you pulled the trigger. So one of the last trips I did targeting dog tooth tuna was actually off, um, I always forget the name of the reef, so I'll try to remember it here, um, Scott Reef in WA. Um, so that's in between um, Broome and T East Timor pretty much, so it's out in the middle of nowhere. Um, uh, out by Ashmore Reef where the boat people and stuff come through. And the good thing about that spot is actually been heavily fished for shark. Um, so um, the dog tooth there are pretty much the, 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 the key predator. And you tend to, when you put a spear in one, don't lose them to shark. So we went out there with a uh, operation um, called Diverse Water Sports, which is based in Broome. And their uh, vessel is called Karma 4, which I'm hoping to go out again in a couple of years time. We, um, we didn't get big doggies when we were there, but we felt that the water temperature was probably a little bit warm um, and we possibly didn't have the right moon phase either. So the next trip we're planning to go a little bit earlier, cooler water, fish coming closer to the surface and, um, and get the right moon phase. And from a Queensland perspective, I've typically gone out with, um, with Eastern Voyager um, and Tura Charters. Um, and we typically go out to the isolated reefs offshore. Probably the best reef I've, I've speared there is Cato, which is the most southern of the reefs, um, and typically the one with the worst anchorage, so you need to have the right time of the year to head there. And typically the best time of year is in sort of November where you get those doldrums and quite flat um, um, sea conditions up there in Queensland. Um, as far as, as um, tropical spearfishing goes, I mean, there's obviously a host of other overseas destinations as well. Obviously with COVID at the moment, it's probably a little bit harder to get to them, but people have great results in Indonesia. Um, I've speared in Vanuatu, I've speared in PNG for doggies. Um, there's great um, dog tooth in Africa, um, and there's a couple of operations in Tonga as well. So there's plenty of overseas uh, options as well, but there's some fantastic diving here in Australia um, um, for, for dog tooth, so um, you don't have to venture overseas if you, if you want to try for what, you know, I think is, well, certainly the hardest fighting fish and, and the one that I'm, I'm keen, there's two fish I really want to want to get, a, a dog tooth over 50 kilos and a quality yellow, uh, yellow um, fin tuna, so those are sort of the two fish on my, my target list moving forward. Um, so look, that probably covered most of the notes I had on, on blue water spearfishing. Um, are there any questions at all out there? At the moment, I don't think so. Does anybody have any questions? Well, what was the name of that uh, charter business up off Cairns, Neil? Oh, the, it's not off Cairns, it's off Gladstone. Uh, uh, so it's, it's Tura Charters. I noticed the other day they're actually up for sale, but... Um, but, um, and the boat I've been going out on, they've got two boats. They've got the Chura and they've got the Eastern Voyager. The Eastern Voyager is the bigger of the two. Uh, there's one out of Cairns, which I haven't been on, but apparently they are uh, really focused on Spiros, which is Norcat. Um, mm. I think they're still called Norcat, but they're, they're based out of Cairns. Um, so there's a few charter operators around. Um, you know, I tend to um, look, I guess, for, I like Eastern Voyager because they are quite focused on safety and they don't take too many risks. And I think that when you're that far offshore, you do need to have a, you know, a sensible crew um, and a good team because um, you know, you're a long way, you're out past where they can even get a helicopter out to you. So you, you need to sort of be making, making smart decisions. Yeah, cool. Tane's asked um, how deep are the reefs blue water? Oh, look, it varies, um, you know, depending on where you are. Like, certainly, um, if you look at, you're talking where we're going out after Bluefin, there is, a, you know, you're in 2,000, 3,000 um, um, 
fathoms of water. So you're right off the continental shelf. You're just in total, well, you call it blue water, but it's not so blue down there. There's all sorts of floating things in the water. It's quite dark and gloomy when you look down, but normally you've got 20 or 30 meters visibility. Um, up in the, the reefs, um, up north, um, Cato, Ken, Frederick, all those sort of reefs, now they can break the surface um, and you know drop off really, really quickly. And that kind of country that you're looking for, you know, really steep drop-offs, um, current running up to the edge of them, and that holds, you know, your pelagic species holds the bait up against the fringing edge of the reef, and then the pelagic species are coming in um, to target uh, or to eat those fish. So you've got that whole food chain going. Um, I typically find dog tooth um, at times, particularly if you've got the right moon face, and get them in quite shallow um, water. Um, and I typically, if I'm doing a, a drift that's running off the reef, then you're typically getting dog tooth to start with, um, and they'll hang around with you for a while. And then as you drift further out, you start getting wahoo. The two can intermingle um, by, you know, um, definitely, and I've seen uh, wahoo in shallower water as well, but typically I find wahoo in deeper water and, and dog tooth in any depth of water. They can certainly be deep as well, but I've certainly got them up into, into shallow conditions. So it just really depends on, on you know, the um, time of the, the day that you uh, that you're, you're targeting them. Tend to find close to the dark, the dog tooth tend to um, be in shallower water. One thing I didn't mention before with Wahoo as well is they can often be pretty much on the surface. So um, don't always be looking down because uh, more times than not a Wahoo will approach you from quite shallow. Um, and I often find with Wahoo that they get attracted to the outboard motor. So it's not uncommon to be the first person to enter the water and there be a Wahoo just sitting there beside you. And believe me, when I've got that big five rubber cannon and I've got a Wahoo sitting there beside me, it's actually quite hysterical trying to load that gun and, and get a shot up with a wire who's in there right beside you. <laughs> awesome. Do we have any other questions out there? Uh, no? so just, yeah, just that chart of business in Western Australia that Neil mentioned. Yeah, so that's, um, the, they've got a shop in Broome called Diverse Water Sports and the boat is called Karma. K-A-R-M-A. -A. Now, um, Chance, who's a guy that runs that, did say to me when I called him um, a few months back that they weren't sure whether they were going to keep the spearfishing charter going or not. So I'm hoping he is, but um, I haven't called him back recently to see if that's still on the cards or not. But if you get a chance to get across there, I, I really do recommend it. The other cool thing about spearfishing um, in local um, conditions, whether it be over in, in Broome or um, up the Coral Sea, is that um, you can take fish back with you. So you can fly them. We always um, bring a cart and a fish home each. Um, so you, know, you certainly can't do that very easily from overseas. Um, you're generally giving the fish away. So um, it's a good thing to obviously respect what you catch and, and enjoy it and eat it when you get back home. Big Neil, I've got another question. Um, Glenn Sands just asked if you could run through how you connect two blue water floats together without a bungee. Um, yeah. Without a bungee, it's quite simple. And then you can, you can go as simple as just connecting the shark clip to the back of the float like so. so there's your connection to the two. This is reasonably stable. What most people would do is run a, an extra bit of line down from your first shark clip to there so that you've got um, um, a little bit more stability than that, that trailing edge of the float. But, um, um, so in other words, run a cable from here down through that section and then clip. Um, connect your next shark clip to it. Some people run a, a bungee in between. Um, the other thing that I use is I typically use this little float here when I'm connecting a bungee um, to my float line because I tend to find that with a lot of stainless steel that you get the float section um, um, sinking um, or the connection area sinking and then all of the lines get caught so you, you'll get a 
a wahoo or something take off and then all of the floats uh, that are around get connected to that and it takes everybody for a ride. So I try to keep all of my float line up on the surface rather than having anything sinking down. So I, um, I focus on that connection point being buoyant as much as possible. And that's the issue with running two floats is you tend to get a lot more tangles with two floats. So wherever I can, I try to get away with a single float, but uh, fish like that one we got the other day online, 149 kilo fish, that could have easily pulled that single float down and probably would have come up in the end, but it could have been you know four or five kilometers away from, from where we speared it. So it got me thinking, even for bluefin, where I've traditionally used just that single float, I'm gonna to move towards a, a double float setup from now on. Awesome, and Glenn just asked what size float line are you typically using? Uh, so the one I've been, I've used a couple of different sizes. I haven't got the one, I've got a Rob Allen one, um, which we don't sell in Australia, but, um, and I use it for most of my spearfishing, but I find it stretches a little bit and I actually got too thin to pull up. So recently I've moved to, the last couple of years, I've been using a Neptonics one, which is a, a more about 10 mil. And um, now recently I've got Rob Allen to make the new float rope, which I'm gonna be trialing from now on. And we hope to be selling that um, commercially in Australia in the next few months, just waiting for Rob to get pricing sorted out. But it's, it looks like it will be a good float rope. Um, we just got to go through the testing phase and then um, and then get it priced up. And what's the length of that one? I typically use 30 meters. Cool. And um, Tane has asked, do you use a single wrap or a double wrap? Uh, I use a double wrap uh, for when I'm going after pelagic species um, most of the time. Um, just uh, with a breakaway. Um, um, but you know, I'm generally not shooting out to a double wrap range. Um, I actually don't like double wraps at all for, um, for reef type spearfishing. But for blue water, um, I tend to, to, to find that um, you know, it's mostly the breakaway that I'm focused on. So I'm wrapping, I'm just trying to think on my, on my Rob Allen, I use a single wrap with the, with the mono running back down again to where the breakaway is but on that big blue water cannon, that's got a double wrap. Um, and that will shoot out to the double wrap. Um, but um, for reef, I really hate double wrap because you tend to, to get the fish take off, gets all caught up, um, and you don't get enough chance to put pressure on the fish. But for pelagic um, type spearfishing, a double wrap's fine. Okay, so what mono are you using? Uh, just, um, I've just you've got Rob Allen stuff on that, just two mil, um, 400 pound um, monofilament. Generally, um, on my blue water setups, I crimp it twice, um, just for added security, um, just in case one was to slip. Um, I've never had that happen, but, um, but you know, the weak point of your setup in, in blue water spearfishing is definitely the mono. Um, and I guess there always needs to be a weak point. Um, but, um, you know, one thing I didn't mention before is it's really important to keep an eye on all your equipment. Um, you know, um, I lost a really good wire a few years ago to the cable on my slip tip snapping, and I'm sure it would have just been frayed from a fish earlier on, and I could have easily, you know, checked it out and, 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 and swapped it out, but um, had made the mistake. And things like all of your shackles need to be double checked and, and tightened. Your mono needs to be regularly checked. Some people do use cable. In fact, if Chaz was here from, from um, Diverse Water Sports, um, he really is a big believer in, in, in stainless steel cable rather than monofilament. Personally, I think it's a bit dangerous because if you get wrapped in it as you're fighting a sort of fish that's a bit green or a bit live, um, you know, it's you, you can't cut yourself out of that stuff. So. That's why I don't use it, um, but it certainly is stronger um, and less likely to snap. Um, um, and and dog tooth do fight notoriously dirty, so they, if they can, they will get your gear down to the to the, the the rocks. But my feeling with either option is that if it gets your gear down into the the coral and, and wraps you around, then often it will just rip itself off anyway. Yeah, 